Welcome to Worldview from WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. The U.S. was dealt an enviable hand at the end of the Cold War. It was in the driver's seat in a unipolar world. It's managed to parlay that strong hand into a foreign policy that's costly in terms of lives and treasure. John Mersheimer has taken a hard look at the fundamentals of U.S. foreign policy in his new book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dream, and International Realities. And John is a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, and we're going to walk through his ideas of where we're at in the United States and where we're going. We're live today at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's nice to have a live audience here. We're going to take some questions later on. You can even watch us streaming on the internet at the chicagocouncil.org or on Facebook at the Chicago Council's Facebook page. And John, it is good to see you. Nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us. The thing I enjoyed about your book was it really makes a person think about what they believe and what they believe is going on in the world. Um, can you tell us a little about your, how you got to this point? I know you're thinking mostly about the post-Cold War situation. Um, what, what, what was your thinking there? I was very interested in the question of what went wrong uh, in American foreign policy since the days uh, when the Cold War ended. As you all know, there was a huge amount of optimism in the air in the early 1990s, uh, and the United States uh, adopted this very ambitious foreign policy, which I refer to as liberal hegemony. And we thought at the time that we had the wind at our back and we would be able to, in effect, remake the world in our own image. And it's really been, by and large, a failure. Uh, there are a number of places in the world, especially the greater Middle East, where uh, our failures uh, are littered all over the map. And what I wanted to do was try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, how did we end up in the present situation? You posit things as a wrestling match between three different isms <laughs> that are going on in the world, liberalism, and uh, we've got uh, realism, and we've got nationalism out there. And um, wh how did you get into this um, wrestling match between these three isms? And when we're talking about liberalism, we're talking about John Locke liberalism. We're not talking about conservative liberalism, conservatives versus liberals. Um, how, how did you lock in on this, this situation? Yeah, before I say a word about the relationship among those three isms, which is at the center of my story, I do want to reiterate the point that Jerome is getting at, which is that I'm not using liberalism to talk about Democrats and conservatives to talk about Republicans. I'm talking about all Americans as being fundamentally liberal. We live in a liberal democracy, and liberalism is all about rights. And both Democrats and Republicans and conservatives and liberals in the American sense believe in rights. They have disagreements about what those rights should be. But it's very important that everybody understand that when I talk about liberal hegemony, I believe that this is a foreign policy that both Republicans and Democrats have pursued. I view the Republican Party and the Democratic Party on foreign policy as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, okay? But let me say a few words about these three isms. The United States is a fundamentally liberal country, and I thank my lucky stars that I was born in the United States. I love the fact that I live in a liberal democracy. But it's not surprising that at the end of the Cold War, when the United States emerges as the most powerful state on the planet, it is then going to try and take liberalism and export it to the rest of the world. And this, of course, is what I'm talking about when I say the United States is interested in remaking the world in its own image, okay? So what we did was the, is to adopt this policy of liberal hegemony. And my argument is that when liberalism runs up against nationalism and realism, Nationalism and realism beat liberalism at every turn. And that's why the foreign policy we adopted at the end of the Cold War was doomed from the start. I believe that nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. This is a concept that Americans find very hard to get, get their hands around or wrap their head around, but nationalism is very powerful. And you run liberalism up against nationalism, nationalism wins. You run liberalism up against realism, realism wins. 
And this, in my opinion, is what explains our failures. Now, you spend a good time in the book talking about why <clears throat> that is and the state of nature that we're in that, that kind of presents itself. Um, do that a little bit, because it's interesting. We're, we're social animals, um, but uh, this is an individualistic proposition, liberalism, in your mind. Uh, I want to talk a little bit in response to Jerome's question about the relationship between liberalism and nationalism and why I think nationalism trumps liberalism. Uh, and it really does go back to human nature. And one of the central questions that any person has to ask him or herself when you think about human nature is whether you believe that we are fundamentally social animals who carve out space for our individualism, or you believe that we are fundamentally individuals who form social contracts. Liberalism starts with the assumption that we are all individuals who form social contracts. That's why liberal theorists like Locke are referred to as social contract theorists. So the focus is on individualism. Nationalism assumes that we are all tribal from the get-go. We are born into groups, and our allegiance to those groups overrides almost everything else. And nationalism assumes that the key group in the modern world is the nation. And we are born into nations, and our allegiance to those nations is very powerful. This is not to say we can't carve out space for our individualism. Now, to go back to liberalism for a second, as I said to you, liberalism assumes that human beings are individuals from the get-go. And liberalism also places a very high premium on rights inalienable rights, the whole notion that every person on the planet, every person on the planet is born with a set of rights. Well, once you have an individualistic ideology that says everybody has the same set of rights, regardless of borders, regardless of boundaries, you have a universalistic ideology. And liberalism at its core, when it comes to foreign policy especially, operates on this universalistic impulse. Nationalism, on the other hand, is very particularistic. It privileges the group, the tribe, the nation. I'm talking with John Mersheimer about his book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. We're at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I wanted to ask you about a real world application of this. Is there a spot on the planet where you see this happening to the US in foreign policy over the last 15 years that you could uh, exemplify that with? Yeah, the best example would be the greater Middle East. If you think about the Bush Doctrine, the Bush Doctrine was all about turning the Middle East, which had no history of liberal democracy, into a sea of liberal democracies. And the basic operating assumption was that if we could topple regimes in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Iran, and get rid of the tyrants or the dictators, and replace them with liberal democracies, uh, we would all live happily ever after. Because the principal operating assumptions were that liberal democracies do not violate human rights or individual rights in any meaningful way. So that if you create a sea of liberal democracies in the Middle East, you take the human rights violation problem off the table, number one. Number two, the second assumption is that liberal democracies don't fight against each other. And if liberal democracies don't fight against each other, you then would get peace in the Middle East. And that would, in effect, take terrorism and proliferation as problems off the table. And the third assumption is that you make the world safe for democracy by creating a world where there are only liberal democracies. Right? So this was the principal set of operating assumptions. And of course, we went into Iraq, let's focus on Iraq, thinking that we could topple Saddam Hussein and then we could create a liberal democracy. And then we could move on to Syria and Iran and so forth and so on. But the problem we ran into, Jerome, is we ended up occupying Iraq. And any time you occupy a country, 
nationalism begins to spring up among the people who you are occupying, and you find that you have an insurgency on your hands. Many of the people in this audience are old enough to remember the Vietnam War. Right? We learned very quickly that the idea that you could go into a country like Vietnam, occupy it, and rearrange the politics in that country was a prescription for disaster. You remember when the Soviets went into Afghanistan? I remember at the time, most of my colleagues in the national security community thought that this was a disaster. The Soviets are on the march. They've gone into Afghanistan. I said, are you serious? This is the best possible thing that could happen to us. What we should hope for is that the Soviets would invade Afghanistan, just like they should have hoped that we invaded Vietnam. This is jumping into a briar patch, jumping into a quagmire. It's the last thing you want to do. And why is that the case? Nationalism. You all know how Americans hate the idea of the Russians interfering in our politics, violating our sovereignty, violating our sense of self-determination. Sovereignty and self-determination are what nationalism is all about. We hate the idea that any country would try to rearrange our politics in any way. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Are you surprised that people in Iraq, people in Syria, people in Libya are not terribly happy about the fact that we think we have a right to interfere in their politics? So what's going on in the Middle East is basically liberal hegemony and nationalism running up against each other, and nationalism wins almost every time. I wonder if you're putting too much emphasis on the faults of liberalism. Um, there's a possibility that, you know, I mean, you take issue with our favorite line in the, in the Declaration of Independence in the book, the one about all men being created equal with inalienable rights. Um, when that was put there so many years ago, was that really just an aspirational thing? It was not, um, clearly the founders were not granting rights to women and slaves and things like that. The, the United States went on this barnstorming thing across the continent where they pushed everybody out, took all their land, started ricocheting around Latin America. We went to the Philippines. We were an imperial power after World War II. We started knocking off Iran and Guatemala for economic reasons. A lot of people would argue that the Iraq wars were of economic in nature, that we really wanted to control the global economy with oil rather than spread liberal democracy. We never really go to places and insert liberal, liberal situations. We, we go in there and put in dictators a lot of the time. Well, let me make two sets of points. One is just on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, there is no question that it is a document that privileges mainly in theory at the time, as Jerome pointed out, uh, liberal values. It is a thoroughly liberal document in all sorts of ways. However, if you look at the Declaration of Independence very clearly, you will see that it is filled with nationalism. It is all about creating an American nation state. Ho Chi Minh, as many of you know, was a big fan of the Declaration of Independence. And what Ho Chi Minh liked about Declaration of Independence was not the liberalism. What he liked was the nationalism, the sovereignty, the self-determination. So the Declaration of Independence has liberalism and nationalism in it. And those two can coexist. I want to be very clear on this. I view Madeleine Albright. I love to talk about Madeleine Albright because she is a canonical liberal. Right. If there's anybody who I identify in my head with liberal hegemony, it's Madeleine Albright. But she's also a thoroughgoing American nationalist. Her most famous words are these. When asked why the United States intervenes all over the planet, she said, we are the indispensable nation. We stand taller. We see further. Just think about those words. We. We as opposed to the other. Right. We stand taller, we see further. In other words, she's saying we are superior, another one of the earmarks of nationalism. Right. And furthermore, she actually uses the word nation. We are the indispensable nation. We stand taller, we see further. Madeleine Albright thinks that we have the right, we have the responsibility, and we have the capability to interfere in the politics of countries all over the planet. This is nationalism. Of course, in her case, married together with liberalism. So those two things go together. Now, the second part of your question deals with the fact that the United States has acted in quite illiberal ways 
uh, over its history. And there is no question that's the case. But my argument in the book is that the only time the United States has really been free to pursue a liberal foreign policy was when the Cold War ended and it did not have to pay attention to the balance of power. During the bipolar Cold War and before that in the multipolar world, the United States basically acted according to the dictates of realism and often behaved in a brutal manner, as Jerome explained. And we covered it up with liberal rhetoric, but we were not behaving in very liberal ways. But when the Cold War ended, because we were so powerful, we were the sole pole, the sole great power on the planet, we were free to pursue liberal hegemony. And I believe that the people who ran American foreign policy from 1989 forward were pursuing a liberal policy in good faith and thinking that they really could remake the world in America's image and it would be, we would be all the better for it. And by the way, Steve Walt is coming to talk to you, I believe next month, about his new book, which reflects this basic view that I just laid out in his title, which is called The Hell of Good Intentions. <laughs> But as my mother used to say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm talking with John Mersheimer. We're discussing his book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. We are live at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. You can see us streaming on the internet at chicagocouncil.org. We're going to take a quick break and come back. I'm Jerome McDonald. You're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. Okay, we're going to break for about a minute, 15 seconds, so get those bites in now. Thank you very much. Thirty seconds. Can you hear me, Jerome? Are you hearing me? Okay. Stand by. Are we being filmed? This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're live at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and talking with John Mersheimer, professor of political science at the University of Chicago. We're discussing his new book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. I wanted to ask you a question about um, U.S. leadership these days. There's a lot of anxiety about the U.S. abandoning its global leadership role. and. Uh, uh, Robert Kagan was here uh, recently, and he's been writing in the Washington Post about this and says that we're returning to the jungle by, uh, by abandoning our leadership role in the world. 
and says things that, you know, like the Saudi killing Khashoggi's is because they know that Washington's not going to do anything about it. We've let down our guard on, on standing for something, and what we're left with is the jungle. Um, do you want us to go back to the jungle, John? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly it means uh, to talk about the jungle, but let me make a couple points. First of all, the United States has fought seven wars since the Cold War ended. Uh, we have been at war for two out of every three years since 1989. This is really quite remarkable. Uh, one would think that that would mean that we were in the jungle. Uh, Furthermore, there's no question that the unipolar world is disappearing or has already disappeared, and we are now in a multipolar world. President Trump and his lieutenants have made that a key theme. And this is not due to any relaxing of American leadership. Uh, it's due largely to the fact that uh, the Russians have come back from the dead, and we've ended up having very bad relations with them. Uh, and furthermore, the rise of China. So with great power politics back, one could argue we're in the jungle. But it's not because America has given up uh, its leadership position. I find the whole concept of leadership sort of meaningless. Uh, am I interested in America being the leader of the world? Mm, not really. What I want to know is what are the policies that we should pursue to maximize the security of the United States? What areas of the world should we care about? When should we be willing to fight in those regions? And what kinds of military forces should we build for each of those scenarios? Uh, I am fully in favor of the United States remaining the most powerful state on the planet, because as a good realist, I think that's very important uh, for purposes of uh, securing our position in the world. But. Uh, I don't know what it means to say we should uh, privilege the concept of leadership, that we should want to lead the world. Uh, obviously, we want to be a, a very important player in, in all sorts of ways. But leadership is just a concept I don't have much use for. Isn't it nice to have a lot of allies in the world? And when you have a lot of allies, sometimes they have a certain expectations of a, of a leader, like at the end of the Cold War. Here were all these states that wanted to join the international institutions that you set up, the European Union, NATO. Uh, there are expectations in when the Libya situation was happening. The Europeans seemed to want the United States to do something and persuaded Barack Obama to, to intervene in Libya. Um, it, when you've got friends out there, there are expectations that you've got to do stuff to, to be, be a leader, to, to sh take your shared values, get out there, and, and show them. Yeah, but you haven't said anything about why these allies are important and why we should have these allies, right? You're just talking about we have allies, they're friends, they want us to be the leader of the pack, and so forth and so on. OK, but for what purpose? Look, I believe that the rise of China is the principal threat to the United States today and will be for the foreseeable future. And I believe that the United States needs allies in Asia, especially in East Asia, for purposes of containing the Chinese threat. And uh, I actually think that President Trump has not done a good job of uh, forming a balancing coalition, forming an alliance to contain China. But all of this is to say I think allies in East Asia are important because I think containing China is important. But let's go to Europe. I am in favor of pulling out of Europe. I've been in favor of pulling out of Europe since the early 1990s. Uh, I see no reason that the United States has to be in Europe protecting the Europeans who are perfectly capable of protecting themselves. Jerome says that these Europeans want us to protect them. I'm hardly surprised. 
Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they want us to spend precious resources defending them so that they can spend precious resources building beautiful airports, building beautiful infrastructure, and having much better school systems than we have here in Chicago? I'm very interested in improving the infrastructure in the United States of America. I'm very interested in spending a lot more money on research and development. I'm very interested in improving our schools. And if I could take money away from defending Europeans, who not surprisingly want to be defended by us, and spending it at home, or spending it for the purposes of containing the Chinese, I would do that. Uh, th that's great. So your, your, la your final chapter is called The Case for Restraint. Um, how much restraint do you want to have in this situation? Do, um, can we cut the defense budget in, what, half? Or can we spend like crazy on schools? Well, first of all, you wouldn't have to cut the defense budget by much to spend like crazy on schools. <laughs> You'd only have to take a small slice out of the defense budget. Uh, uh, no question about that. And, uh, and by the way, given the budget deficits in this country, it might be best if we didn't spend the money at all. Um, but uh, uh, when you talk about restraint, I mean, everybody has different views on this. I'll, I'll give you my two cents. I'm not interested in restraint when it comes to dealing with the Chinese, as I tried to make clear to you in my answer to the previous question. I'm deeply concerned about containing the Chinese. Uh, the first place that I would cut back in is Europe. I think there's no good justification for the continuation of NATO. And with regard to the Persian Gulf, which is the other key area for the United States, in my opinion, the three key areas of the world for the United States are East Asia, uh, Europe and, and the Persian Gulf. With regard to the Persian Gulf, I would not deploy many forces in the region. Uh, and what I would do is I'd maintain an over-the-horizon capability, uh, similar to what the Carter and Reagan administrations did uh, with the rapid deployment force during the Cold War. I think we want to have the military capability to intervene in the Gulf. And I would be physically present, or I would have American military forces physically present in Asia. Uh, and then one final point, I would definitely get out of the business of invading other countries and occupying for them for, them for the purposes of promoting democracy. Uh, and all in all, I think that this would save a substantial amount of money. The counter to what I just said is that if China continues to rise, this may be such a Goliath that we'll have to spend enormous amounts of money uh, to contain the Chinese. Uh, I hope China does not continue to rise. But if it does, I'd be willing to spend that money. Uh, and I'd be willing, in that context, to exercise American leadership. I'm talking with John Mersheimer about his book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. We're live at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And there's a section in your book that talks about um, uh, you come back once in a while to the erosion of the social fabric at home and how liberal democracies can come to shoot themselves in the foot and not be as liberal at home anymore. Uh, it, how, is that happening to us now? Yes. My argument is that liberalism abroad leads to illiberalism at home. And the problem is that if you have this expansive foreign policy, uh, you become a militarized state. This is something that the founding fathers worried about greatly. Just think about the United States. As I said before, we have fought seven wars since the Cold War ended. We have been at war for two out of every three years. This has consequences. And furthermore, it's helped generate a terrorism problem. I mean, the principal reason that we have a terrorism problem is not because they hate us because of who we are. They hate us because of our policies. They hate the fact that we're interfering in their politics and they're kicking back. And the end result is when you have a terrorism problem, you create a national security state to monitor people to make sure that you don't have terrorist attacks on your homeland. Uh, so it's very important to understand that it's, uh, it, it is hard to create and maintain a liberal democracy, especially with that word, that word liberal, a liberal democracy uh, in a world where the United States is traipsing all over the world fighting wars. And again, the founding fathers fully understood this, and I think they were correct. Why isn't there more accountability for people who get us into bad foreign policy things? This is really a great question, because we just seem to go from one foreign policy disaster to another, right? And the people who lead us 
from disaster to disaster remain in power? Why haven't we uh, you know, switched gears and gone in a different direction? And by the way, I would point out to you that Barack Obama was elected on the platform that he was going to change American foreign policy. And remember, Barack Obama said that we were going to do nation building at home, which I applaud. He, of course, was ultimately defeated by the blob, otherwise known as the foreign policy establishment, which beat him back. And he admitted that in the very famous interview with Jeffrey Goldberg a few months before he left the White House. Donald Trump was elected by running against liberal hegemony. Uh, it very clearly uh, ran against liberal hegemony. It was not the only reason he got elected. But as I like to tell many of my friends who are liberal hegemonists, uh, their foreign policies are one of the principal reasons we have Donald Trump in the White House, right? Uh, but there's no accountability. And why is that the case? I think there's no accountability for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that the American foreign policy establishment has come up with a formula for fighting these wars that uh, uh, allows us not to win, but not many Americans are affected by the wars. Uh, it's the old volunteer military. We have this very narrow slice of the society that's willing to serve in the military. And for reasons that boggle my mind, they're willing to go back to places like Afghanistan five, six, seven times to fight wars that they're not going to win or they've already lost, right? Uh, but the fact is that the vast majority of Americans don't fight, and their children don't fight in these wars. If we had a draft, if we had a situation like we had in the 1960s with the Vietnam War, we wouldn't have these fights. Charles Rangel said in the run-up to the Iraq War, if we had a draft, we wouldn't have had a war. I think he was absolutely right. But we don't have a draft. We have an all-volunteer military that's willing to fight and bear the costs of the fighting. And in terms of the money that's involved, we're able to kick the can down the road on that one. And it's not like most Americans feel like we're paying for these wars now. So there's no real cost to the American people. And the American people don't care that much about foreign policy. This is another key factor. The reason most Americans don't care much about foreign policy is that we're the most secure great power in the history of the world. Despite all this talk that you hear about how threatened we are and how dangerous the world has been since 1990. This is nonsense. The United States is separated from its principal adversaries by two giant moats. It's got thousands of nuclear weapons. And in the unipolar world, by definition, we were the only great power on the planet. Does it get any better than that? <laughs> Seriously. And this is why most Americans don't care about foreign policy. This is why you have to have a Chicago Council on Global Affairs to get people interested in foreign policy, because we are remarkably secure. Um, one of the things that uh, seems to be happening during the Trump presidency is that some of the things he ran against are becoming more popular. Um, the use of tariffs seems to be uh, bucking up free trade support. People are more supportive of free trade. Democrats are more supportive of free trade than they used to be. Uh, the latest council survey has support for NATO going up. NATO's support is going up because people feel bad that uh, Donald Trump is criticizing it. In the end of his presidency, do we go back to where we were before? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think you know, this gets down to the question of whether you think Trump is a cause of the change that's taking place or Trump is a manifestation of the change that's taking place. Uh, I believe that Trump is a manifestation of changes that are taking place. Uh, globalization, the economic part of globalization, uh, is causing huge, num huge amounts of trouble uh, in industrialized countries all over the world, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. And this explains the rise of nationalism and the rise of right-wing parties uh, in Europe, and it says a lot about why Donald Trump got elected. He ran on a policy platform of America first. He was basically saying all this internationalism, all your concern about American leadership, right, is not something we don't care much about. We want you, Donald Trump, to take care of the American people, the broader public. And this, of course, was the same message that was sent to Barack Obama. Uh, so I think um, we're not going to end up in the same place.
talking with John Mersheimer, and his book is The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. We are at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs today. We've got a live audience. When we come back, we are going to take some questions from people who are in the audience, and it'll be uh, fun. We'll take some that are coming in on the internet as well. We're streaming this event at the chicagocouncil.org, and we'll be back after the break. I'm Jerome McDonald. You're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. I can ask anyone who has a question for John to come step to the microphone over there, and there will be someone there to adjust the microphone according to your height. Uh, feel Supporter free to of the Iraq the War. Between what's happening told us it was all going to go swimming. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Thesis of John's book. Okay. We're back in one minute. So again, anyone who wants to ask John a question, please line up behind the microphone right now. Thank you. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Stand by. Ten seconds. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald, talking today with John Mersheimer, professor of political science at the University of Chicago. His new book is The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams, and International Realities. We're live at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. There is an audience here with uh, people uh, plates. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Ma'am, say, do you have a question for John Mersheimer? I do. It was fascinating when you were talking about the uh, military support in Europe and the fact that two presidents have been elected so as to um, break away from all of the military um, functions that we've been serving. Do you think it's possible that it's an economic issue that our that the defense spending lobbies are very strong and don't want that kind of change, and that's why Congress just sticks with the status quo. I think that there is no question that the military-industrial complex, as President Eisenhower termed it, does have some in influence. But I, I don't believe that's the principal reason. Uh, I do believe that what's going on here is that liberalism is hardwired into American DNA. And Americans, given the opportunity to export liberalism around the world, will do it if they have the opportunity. I think it's the fact that we were so powerful at the end of the Cold War and that we believed so fervently at the time that liberal democracy was the future. Think back to Francis Fukuyama's very famous article, The End of History. You look back at that carefully. What you see is that Fukuyama said, we defeated fascism in the first half of the, of the 20th century. We defeated communism in the second half of the 20th century. And now the future was all democracy. It was going to take some time to get there. And then you marry that to the other really famous article written at the time, which was Charles Krauthammer's article, The Unipolar Moment, which said that we emerged from the Cold War extremely powerful, and we should use that power to our advantage. So you take Fukuyama and you marry him to Krauthammer, 
and you're off to the races. And I think this is what was driving the train all along. I don't think the military industrial complex played that key a role in getting us to pursue all these um, crusades. But in the end, is it making it hard for us to get out of them? It, 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 we, we look at what's happening with Saudi Arabia, and Donald Trump's like, I can't cut the, I can't stop things with Saudi Arabia. We've got arms deals with them. It's really lucrative. Uh, I don't think it's the arms trade with Saudi Arabia that is the nub of the problem. I think the nub of the problem is that they produce one heck of a lot of oil, and we care about oil. You remember I said before, there are three areas of the world that matter to the United States strategically and have over a long period of time, Europe, East Asia, and I didn't say the Middle East, I said the Persian Gulf, and it's because of the oil in the Persian Gulf that we really care, and the Saudis are, uh, they are really the kingmakers when it comes to making oil or producing oil in that region. Sir, you have a question for John Mersheimer. Yes, sir. Uh, under each of these systems, how does the world, both country and individual, pay back its debt? I'm not sure I understand your question. Under which system? Under any system, how does the world pay back its debt? You're worried about the U.S. deficit? Realism. Nationalism. And, and uh, conservatism. Liberalism. Well, uh, I mean, th there are different kinds of debts. Some of those debts are impossible to pay back. I mean, the United States has defended Europe since the Cold War ended. We've, we've kept an American military presence in Europe. We've kept NATO intact. And you could say, and I think most Europeans I know would admit this, that they're indebted to us for serving as a pacifier. The vast majority of Europeans I know think that the United States has kept the peace in Europe. Uh, let's assume that that's true. The question is, how do they pay back that debt? Uh, I'm not sure that they can do it in any monetary way. They can tell us they appreciate what we did. Uh, they can help us in places like Afghanistan uh, or Iraq or, or in our fight against ISIS and so forth and so on. But it's really hard for them to pay back that debt. Um, and then with regard to money, right, when you fight world wars, like World War I and World War II, we end up lending huge amounts of money to our allies, and they have to pay back that debt. But we're not you know, involved in that world very much anymore. So I'd say that paying back debts is really not a big deal these days. But, um, you can't pay the, the debt back, as you say. If you can't pay it back, you can't pay it back. <laughs> I mean, there's not much you can do about it. Um, I don't think the United States would invade a country to get its money back. Uh, we've got Andy Zemanides, who I talk with about Greece frequently on the program with us today. Nice to see you, Andy. Nice to see you, Jerome. We talk, you told us a lot about nationalism versus liberalism. But is nationalism, how is that playing out in terms of policies? I'm seeing people using nationalism in Europe and elsewhere to get control, but are they reverting back to realism? So is there, like, is there some alliance between nationalism and realism uh, over liberalism? Or is there like liberal realists and national, nationalist realists? No, I think the, the key tension is between nationalism and liberalism. And liberalism is really all about internationalism. Right. The United States has been highly internationalist uh, since the Cold War ended. Remember, we were trying to spread liberal democracy all over the planet. Uh, furthermore, we had this open international economy that we were deeply interested in getting countries that were outside of the system to join. We wanted to bring the Chinese, we wanted to bring the Russians into that open international economy. And of course, we also had all of these international institutions that we had created during the Cold War that we wanted to expand uh, across the globe and we wanted to bring new members into. Just think about NATO expansion and EU expansion into Eastern Europe. Right? This is all part of a liberal foreign policy. This is all about internationalism. It's why liberal hegemony is sometimes called liberal internationalism. The problem is that 
the policies that we pursued worked for a while. The 1990s were the heyday of liberal internationalism. But starting in about 2000, things began to go south. And the end result is you get Brexit, you get Donald Trump, and you get the rise of the right in Europe. And this is all about people beginning to think in less international terms and to begin thinking in more national terms. And what you see, actually, and I think this makes perfect sense if you think about it, is that among the elites in Western Europe and in the United States, liberal internationalism is alive and well. It's in the publics in these countries where you see nationalism coming to the fore. And again, I think Donald Trump understood this very well. And this is why he ran on an America first platform. An America first platform is nationalism par excellence. And he was basically trashing the liberal international economic order, as you said, and talking about the importance of tariffs and economic nationalism and so forth and so on. And as I pointed out to you before, I do not think that Trump is the cause of the trouble that we're in today. Right? I think Trump is a manifestation of the trouble that we're in today. And we're in trouble today because we pursued a foreign policy, liberal hegemony, that I argue was destined to fail. Sir, you have a question for Jan Mersheimer. Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Lang. I've just got a kind of a definitional question. Um, you talk about liberal democracy. Yes. And I'm trying to think of a country that is a democracy, a true democracy that isn't liberal. Um, and I'm wondering if you just took the word liberal off of there and you would be actually having some doubt about democracy, because I don't think there's that, you know, I don't, I don't know of a single democracy that isn't liberal. England, Japan, the US, there are places where you can vote where there's control that doesn't really show up at the polls, I, but those aren't true democracies. So what is the difference in your mind between liberalism and democracy and is it wrong to be fighting for democracy? Well, democracy is all about voting. And liberalism is all about rights. And those are two very different things. And it's important to understand that you can have an illiberal democracy, right? And you have an illiberal democracy where you vote, right? And it's a fair election, and the majority wins, and the majority then suppresses the rights of the minority, or treats the minority like a second-class set of citizens. And our founders were very concerned about that and built a lot of protections in. But, and so do most countries in one way or the other, that are true democracies, or well, democ I wouldn't democracy, use in that they have you know, fair voting, um, but I just think that when you strip it out, I think you're actually somehow talking about democracy not being good. No, no, I, I'm, I'm talking here about liberal democracies. And, and, and I'm actually privileging the liberal part of the story, not the democratic part of the story. My, as I make clear in the book, I believe virtually all liberal states are also liberal democracies. So when you talk about liberal states, you're talking about liberal democracies. But I'm privileging the liberal side of the story because I think the emphasis on rights is of enormous importance for understanding why a liberal foreign policy is a universalistic foreign policy, right? That believes that if you spread liberal democracy, with the emphasis on the word liberal, all over the planet, you solve the human rights violations problem and you make the world more peaceful, thus eliminating terrorism and proliferation as problems. Let's try to sneak in one more question before we go off the air. We're going to continue with questions for a little bit with John uh, when we are off the air. Uh, sir, you have a question. Yes, my name is Bill McInerney. I just wonder, why are you offended by the notion of a rising China, and why should America be opposed to that historic fact? 
my view is that any great power, like the United States, should want to dominate its region of the world, as we do. We are a regional hegemon. And at the same time, we want to make sure that no other great power dominates its region of the world the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. So we did not want Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, or the Soviet Union to dominate either Asia or Europe, right? And we went to great lengths to prevent that. And your question is why? Uh, most Americans never think about this, but the reason that we are running all around the world interfering in everybody else's politics is because we have no security threats in the Western Hemisphere. We are free to roam, okay? And that's because we are a regional hegemon. If you're China, what you want the United States to do is have trouble with Brazil and Mexico and Canada. Then we have to focus on Brazil, Mexico, and Canada, and we can't be in their backyard, okay? What the United States does not want is it does not want China to be a regional hegemon because then it's free to roam into the Western Hemisphere the way we roam into Asia and into Europe. And from an American point of view, this is the Monroe Doctrine, which I'm sure you know well. From an American point of view, the last thing we want is a foreign country, foreign great power to be more specific, wandering into the Western Hemisphere with military forces and forming an alliance with another country in the region. You're old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. You remember how we went ballistic at the mere idea that the Soviets would put missiles in Cuba. This was categorically unacceptable to us. And then form a military alliance with Cuba. We still can't have good relations with Cuba because we're mad at them for what they did you know, back in the 60s. Right? So the Americans don't want any foreign country to be free to roam into the Western Hemisphere. I want to make one final point in response to your question. I believe, I'm not an isolationist, I want to be very clear on that, my views on China should make that perfectly clear, but the case for isolationism is very powerful. It is very powerful. The United States was an isolationist country in the 1930s because the arguments in favor of isolationist are very, isolationism were very powerful. And your question gets to the essence of this issue. Your basic view is, why should we care about China? The isolationists said in the 30s, when the Japanese were on the march in East Asia and Hitler was on the march in Europe, who cares? Why? Because we're separated from East Asia by 6,000 miles, and we're separated from Europe by the Atlantic Ocean. John Mersheimer is the author of The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. Thanks a lot for joining us today and uh, having a great conversation about where we're at in the world. We've been live at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thanks a lot to Ian Whitaker, Victoria Williams, John Macha, Kellen Martin, and Andy Char Charniki, and uh, John Chu. And we hope you can join us tomorrow for Worldview. We're going to talk uh, with Rashid Halidi, and we'll talk about Saudi Arabia. Hope you can join us then. I'm Jerome McDonald. You've been listening to Worldview on WBEZ. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize we were still on the... Thanks. Um, so you mentioned the case for pulling out of Europe, at least from if, if we believe that liberalism has failed there, and we're seeing in Hungary, in Poland, um, the, the increase of illiberal democracy, and then outside of the EU and Turkey, the, the nature of our relationship has changed there as well. Is there a realist case for remaining involved in those areas and hoping that they continue to be democracies or somewhat more liberal? Yeah. Let me make two points in response to your excellent question. Uh, one is just on the rise of the right in Poland uh, and Hungary, and I think also in Germany. Uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the refugees 
uh, and also, uh, if you look at the poll data on why Brexit, uh, I, I think uh, open borders there, the Schengen Agreement, was a source of big problem, big trouble. And, and, and that's all about nationalism, right? The idea that you can mix people up in Europe. I could give a 45-minute you know, talk on this. Uh, you're really asking for trouble once you start to begin, once you begin to, to, to mix up different groups of people. Um, but the more important question you asked is, is there a realist case for staying in Europe? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, there are a variety of realist views about the US commitment to Europe and other places around the world. And my good friend Bob Art, who teaches at uh, Brandeis, uh, is, what, is a realist. And he believes in selective engagement. So Bob would say, I agree with John that Europe, East Asia, and the Gulf are the three most important areas of the world. And I want to get out of the democracy promotion business like John, and I want to focus on those three areas like John. But unlike John, I want to stay in all three of those areas. And the reason that Bob wants to stay in all three of those areas is that he believes that we are essential for peace in those areas. We are the pacifier. And if we get out, war will break out. And that will have two negative consequences for us. One, economic. It'll hurt the American economy. And two, we'll get sucked back in. So let's just stay there and prevent the war from breaking out in, to begin with. Right. It's, a, it's a very realist argument. I would also note, in response to the previous gentleman, that the case for isolationism is also a realist argument. Right? It's just saying that there's no area outside of the Western Hemisphere that is strategically important to the United States to the point where we should fight and die in that region. So you see, you could be a realist and an isolationist. You could be a realist and a selective engager like Bob Art. Or you could be a realist and an offshore balancer like John, who only wants to go into a region when there is a potential hegemon. That's why I'm interested in East Asia and why I'm not interested in Europe. Um, tremendously. Uh, Interesting and, and I, I'm I'm uh, I wanted to get a little more clarity on on your critique of globalization. I thought it was it was it was fascinating and you're I couldn't be more correct that there are liberal internet um, internationalists uh, in in elites in Europe and and North America. I, I think also in Asia and and elsewhere. Aren't they the ones who have principally benefited from from globalization? Sure and. Isn't then globalization really an issue of, of governance um, ra rather than globalization being the problem? Isn't it really a matter of, of making sure that more people benefit from globalization than have? Yeah. Uh, I, I actually have a paper uh, on, that I can send you on the rise and fall of the liberal international order. It, it's tangential to this talk. This talks about American foreign policy. Paper is on the rise and fall of the liberal international order. Um, and my basic argument is that the liberal international order contained the seeds of its own destruction, which is consistent with what I said here. But just in response to your question, if you folks haven't read this book by Donnie Roderick, D-A-N-I-R-O-D-R-I-K. I don't know if he's been here, Ivo, you know, to, uh, you know, to speak at the council, but you should get him here. He, he has a book called The Paradoxes of Globalization. Uh, it's a brilliant book. And he basically makes the argument um, that uh, we had this system during the Cold War uh, that was involved a lot of globalization, but it was basically uh, the Bretton Woods system. And, uh, uh, and then when the Cold War ended, as it was coming to an end, and then when it ended, we moved into a period of what he calls hyper-globalization, right? And there are two things that happen. One is we go from GATT to the WTO, right? And he argues that as long as GATT was in place, there were enough loopholes in it, right, that governments could control trade in ways that protected their people. 
And when you went from GATT to the WTO, it became almost impossible with regard to trade for governments to protect people. And then he talks about capital flows and what happens with regard to capital flows once the, uh, uh, the Cold War ends, right? And there's just unlimited capital flows. Capital can switch just from here to there like that. At the same time, he makes the argument that what happens is that because of the rise of Thatcherism and Reaganism, people come to believe that governments are no good at doing much of anything and the market knows best which dovetails exactly with the hyperglobalization I was describing to you. So the end result is that you have this globalization, what he calls hyperglobalization, starting really in the late 80s, early 90s, right? That makes lots of people at the top wealthy, right? This is the economic inequality argument beginning to kick in and does huge amounts of damage down below. Not only do people lose jobs, which they can't then replace, but a lot of people just live in fear that they're next. Because to put it in Schumpeter's terms, you have all this creative destruction in the system. And Donnie Roderick's argument, and this was earlier enunciated by John Ruggie, who was influenced by the great economic historian Karl Polanyi, is that you need a state you know, in this highly globalized economy, a state that can take care of the people and look out for their welfare. And we've moved away from that, right? And the end result is all the trouble that you have today. I, I want to be clear here, this is Roderick's argument, which I'm parroting, and I did not figure this out myself. But his book is very highly regarded. He was seen as something of an outlier to begin with when he first begun to enunciate these views. People like Paul Krugman criticized him quite harshly. But with the passage of time, people have come to understand that he's basically right. And if you sort of want to understand what's going on today, and again, why we have Donald Trump, why we have Brexit, I would strongly urge you to look at Donnie Roderick's book. One more question. Who's the last one? The table is going to wrestle it for it. <laughs> Mine is very basic. Um, you caught my interest, the collision of the isms. I understand what the liberalism and nationalism is, but I like to think in terms of frameworks. And I'm not, I'm, I feel like realism is very squishy in my mind. Could you give, is there a value system that's shared in common by realists? Is there a common structure? I, I don't, I'm not that familiar. I don't, I'm not reading about it <laughs> as a movement. Um, and so this is something you can feel like you've made an impact at least on one person that I'm thinking about this now, but I would sure. like a little more, um, if you could uh, tell me a little bit more about how that. that oh, sure. Goes. China's gonna be happy with this because he advocates <laughs> breeding a whole world of realists at the end of the book. I, I'm happy for that, but I'd like to understand it. <laughs> Well, realism is really all about the balance of power. And it's an ism that basically says that great powers uh, operate in a world where there's no higher authority. There's no 911 they can call on if they get into trouble. And in that kind of world, you want to be as powerful as possible. And if you're a powerful state, you're a major power in the system, you're a great power, you care greatly about the balance of power, and you care greatly about what other states do in terms of their policies that might threaten you. And I'll give you my favorite example from the Cold War. It involves NATO expansion, right? Uh, starting in the mid-1990s, NATO and the EU began to move eastward. And the Russians from the mid-1990s forward screamed bloody murder. They said this is just unacceptable because you're taking a military alliance that was a mortal foe of the Soviet Union and you're slowly but steadily marching it up to our border. Furthermore, you're marching the EU in lockstep with NATO and you're fomenting revolutions to produce liberal democracies in places like Georgia, the Rose Revolution, Ukraine, the Orange Revolution. Right. And the Russians say, we understand what you're doing. You're trying to make all of these countries that used to be part of our empire and that are right on our border part of the West. 
And this is categorically unacceptable to us. Now, I would say that the Russians are speaking like realists, right? They see NATO as a military alliance. They see it as a potential threat. They see it as a threat to their power position. The Americans and their European allies did not see NATO expansion, EU expansion, and the color revolutions as directed at Russia. There's no evidence that we were moving NATO eastward because we thought that there was this serious Russian threat that had to be contained. We had a liberal view of what we were doing. And if you talk to Mike McFall, who I've debated on this issue, this issue, who was the American ambassador in Moscow from 2012 to 2014, he will tell you that I talked to Vladimir Putin and his lieutenants on a number of occasions, and I told Putin and company that NATO expansion was not aimed at them, that they had nothing to worry about. The United States is a benign hegemon, and the United States is simply interested in taking that zone of peace that it created in Western Europe during the Cold War and marching it eastward so that you have a Europe, right, from west up to the Russian border that is very peaceful. And this should be in your interest, Vladimir Putin, because why wouldn't you want a peaceful Eastern Europe? But he, of course, didn't see it that way at all, right? He was seeing the world through realist lenses. So my bottom line here is that realists tend to think in terms of power politics, mocked politique, security, the threat of war, Whereas liberals, although they're interested in ending war and, you know, they're interested in security issues, ultimately, they have a very different way of thinking about international politics that focuses on regime type, right, whether you're a liberal democracy or not, that focuses on economic interdependence, right, and that focuses on international institutions. So again, the name of the game in Eastern Europe was to get the Eastern European countries hooked into these international institutions, NATO and the EU, turn them into liberal democracies, the orange and rose revolution, right? Um, and uh, also uh, to get them hooked on capitalism, economic interdependence, the whole nine yards. And it's just a very different way of thinking about the world. And people like me argue that when you pursue liberal hegemony, you get yourself into a whole heck of a lot of trouble. Because if you go to Moscow and you talk to the Russians, they are realists par excellence. Thank you very much to everyone here at the council for making this happen. Thank you, John Mersheimer.